Um, I'm really good at making weird faces and I'm not weird about sharing it. So a couple videos ago, I did a whole thing on uh, mobile office essentials and you can see I am fully living that mobile office life right now. Um, I wasn't sure when I was going to get a chance to film this video, so here it is on my lunch break. Um, apologies if I've got weird noise because I am in a running car. Maybe I should turn the car off. Let's try that. Alright, I think the sound might be better. Turn off my car. Um, no uh, no air conditioning, no heating, and it is a sunny, sunny fall day, um, so we'll see what we have to do. Um, I wanted to talk about classroom management um, and like behavior strategies in the classroom because I know since we're all coming back post pandemic and students have had a lot of freedom um, and they're not necessarily used to like doing school like um, we did before. I know that a lot of teachers, even like veteran teachers are struggling with classroom management and things like that. And so I wanted to share some of the things that have worked for me before in the past. Um, keeping in mind that not all strategies work for all classes because not all classes are the same. So I'm gonna throw out some strategies and things that have worked for me in the past. It doesn't mean it's gonna work for you. It means you can try it and be like, that was great, Jen, but ba 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 ba. Um, not all kids are the same. They don't all respond the same, you know? So you kind of just have to keep trying, keep pushing until you find something that works or something that kind of works. And, you know, essentially making the best, the best that you can with what you have at the time. Um, I sort of sat down and wrote out my ideas regarding classroom management and they sort of like went into four kind of categories. So I sort of actually like, like I made myself a little map, look at that, um, of things. And the first area I kind of came up with, so the first thing we'll, we'll talk about and we'll kind of like pop it up here, um, is regarding, um, expectations of, of your class. And, um, number one, do you have clear expectations for your class or are you just sort of reacting to things? So, um, being proactive and kind of having a, uh, a set of clear expectations of, of what you want as a teacher and, you know, even like what your students want from you, um, is very important. So it is something you could set ahead of time. It is something you could kind of get a loose idea of ahead of time, but think about maybe developing this set of expectations collaboratively with your students. Now, this is dependent on the age of your students, you know, and their maturity and things. So again, not everything's good for everybody, but maybe have a conversation with your students, you know, ask them about things like consequences or rewards. Like, do you have students in your class? Sometimes if you have students with IEPs, they have very specific behavior intervention plans to follow um, or sometimes reward systems. Regardless of how you feel about like reward systems and incentivizing things, I've got mixed feelings about it. I, you know, again, there's a spectrum with everything, but um, the the point here is to, to at least have something established, like know what you're going for. Cause when you're just sort of jumping into the dark blindly, you don't know what you're, you know, trying to do it, it makes things hard. Depending on your classroom and the personality of the class and the students in your class, you might need to have explicit instruction in your class on things like conflict management or coping skills or self-regulation and organization. I mean, this is why this is essentially SEL, social emotional learning. Even if you are not, you know, a guidance counselor, having students have these skills is going to make a huge difference in your class. Um, and a lot of times it's worth the work up front or even just the quick reminders about things um, in order to have your class work more smoothly. So regardless of how you feel about, you know, SEL and if it's like oh, soft skills, which you and I need to talk because I'm a big fan of SEL skills. I was not explicitly taught them when I was growing up in school. And I really wish they had because as I've become an adult and I've done things like therapy and stuff, I'm like, why didn't I learn this growing up? You might think 
it's a quote unquote waste of time, but it's really not because of the benefits that it gives you in the long term. So think about that. Taking five minutes out at the beginning of the class to talk about like, we're going to do this activity today. What are our expectations? What should we hear in this classroom? What should our classroom look like? Quiet does not always equal classroom management. Um, I'm a big believer in having like a bustling, loud, noisy class, and you can still have good classroom management. You can have a lot of things going on and still have like super engaged students. In fact, I don't know if you have a super quiet, compliant class. I don't know how they can be super engaged. They're probably just being compliant and maybe zoning out. You have a class of zombies. Knock it off. Next part, I want to talk about teacher attitudes, teacher behaviors, or teacher coping skills. Um, number one, ask for help if you need it. So most schools, I know not all, but most schools have a social worker or a guidance counselor, or maybe you have a veteran teacher in your department who has really good classroom management skills, or maybe you have a friend at another school. You know, maybe you have a mentor teacher. Maybe you have, you know, I don't know, an, a really trusted admin. Um, maybe you have a, an instructional coach. Like I'm a tech coach, but I'm also an instructional coach that you can talk to. They can help you sit and brainstorm, come up with ideas together, try things out. Um, or when I say ask for help if needed, maybe you are burnt out and you just need to spend your lunch hour um, having a teletherapy session. I say that because that is literally what I do. Um, I have teletherapy sessions uh, on my lunch hour, not every day, about once a, once a month right now. And um, it's honestly one of the greatest things because you have someone who specifically you're paying to like, you get to vent, you get to <laughs> word vomit, those things aren't going out, but you also get like valuable skills to like help you work with, you know, how to help you deal. Um, be kind to yourself. If you're struggling with a really difficult class, it doesn't mean you're a failure as a teacher. Um, take a deep breath. Remind yourself that you are the adult in this situation and they are the, even if you're teaching a class of high schoolers, they are still the kids in this situation. You are more mature than them. You are in control. Um, you can handle this. You know, you're doing the best you can with a group of kids that are acting, you know, in attention seeking ways. If you're not excited about your content, if you're not excited about your learning, why should your students be? So that's one thing. If you don't even like what you're doing, you it's it is unreasonable, I think, to expect that your kids are gonna like it. How can you infuse relevance and relatability with your content with things that students like? So talk to your students, find out their interests, find out what they, you know, what they like to do. Are they really interested in video games? Are, are they really into sports? Are they really into drawing? Like what is your class? And, and one class isn't going to have like one interest, you know, there's lots of little pockets of things, but you'll find things that are kind of universally-ish relatable. Um, things that you can add in. When I was in middle school, I had um, my ELA teacher, if the example sentence had the name of someone who was a student in our class, my teacher would get so excited and she would make that student read that sentence because like, oh my gosh, it says Sarah and Sarah's over there. Sarah, you do the one with your name. <laughs> like really small, like kind of dumb, corny, kooky, whatever. But I remember being in class and if there was a worksheet and the person's name was Jenny, I was so excited for when it came up and like, cause I knew that I would get called on. So again, it's like, it's so dumb, but like the things that, that can like hook and engage a student is like use names of kids from your class. Why not? If they're paying attention to see if their name comes up. Meh, it's small if you can try it. So um, yeah, do things to make your, your content more exciting because if you're excited, the kids will get more excited. Not only your behaviors, your coping skills, but we got to deal with student coping skills and student behaviors. Um, some things that you can do, not only teaching those explicit strategies for self-regulation and things like that, but opportunities to practice coping strategies, um, mindfulness, self-regulation. Some teachers utilize like a calm corner or some teachers, you may have access to a social worker that you can call on a whim. Great. Good for you. I don't know that world. But other, you know, if you have a second adult in the room that can like, I don't know, sit out in the hallway with a student or depending on the age of your students and the abilities and maturity of your students, send a kid out for, you know, go take a lap and come back, meaning like go walk around the hall and then come back. Take a second to distract yourself. Take a movement break. Um, close your Chromebook. 
take three deep breaths and open your Chromebook back up. You know, like kind of help your students recognize those moments to kind of where they need to reset and they need to um, kind of take a break when they're they're getting into that, you know, maybe getting into the red and getting angry or getting just overwhelmed with the content and they need to just stop and kind of start fresh. Um, encourage that sort of practice, like to not put so much pressure on themselves and to kind of take things at their own pace. Um, offer choices to your students as a way to have them feel a sense of control. Um, so it could be in, you know, assignments like voice and choice and all that stuff. It could just be that like when you come to one of those like headbutt moments, you know, and a kid won't sit in their assigned seat, you know, you say, listen, you have a choice. You can sit in your assigned seat, you can go sit out in the hallway, or we can call the principal, the dean, whatever your your next, you know, escalated resources or whatever. Um, and, and that would be like in an extreme case, I'm just giving you, a, you know, because a lot of times when you get students in those moments of headbutt, they just want control and they don't even care. Like, so if you give them opportunities to make them feel like that, well, you could choose like, like, I'm not sitting in my assigned seat. And it's like, oh, well, maybe I'll sit out in the hall for five minutes. You know, like it, it still makes them like they chose it, but there's, you know, and then the advantage of having them sit out in the hall is they can reset, regulate, all that stuff, come back in. Um, you can either clear off your desk or you can close your Chromebook, but it must stay closed the entire time. Like think of like another way to like make, where you still get what you want, but if the students feel like they have um, a little bit more control, a little bit more choice in the, in the matter. Something that I've noticed a lot in my classes that really affected the, the personality of the class is positive leaders versus negative leaders in the classroom. That a class where I have one or two um, really strong, like outgoing students that kind of lead the climate of the classroom, if they're very positive and they're very like into the projects and the assignments, you will have an amazing class. Now, if you have a couple of students that tend to suck in the students around them with the negativity and the, you know, toxic humor and mean memes and making noises. I, I can't, I'm like, insert eye roll. Um, it really makes the class like a terrible place to be. Um, so the strategy for that, honestly, it's something I really struggle with, but are there ways to take that negativity and turn it into a, a positive leadership in the class? Like sometimes those students are just reaching out for attention. And if you give them that attention or responsibility in the form of like leading, you know, the class, like, okay, I, I noticed that you guys don't seem really jazzed about this assignment. How can we make it more interesting? How can we do this? Um, I saw that you're really into, you know, YouTube videos or sports or whatever. Like, can you show the class how you did that thing? You know, and see if you can find a way. Again, sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. You know, you never know, but you have to try. And if it works, well, why not? And if your class is already a really negative place to be, can't hurt, might help. So give it a shot. Revise if needed. Just because you decide something, you know, at the beginning of the year doesn't mean you're stuck with it for the whole school year. You can stop at the end of the week, you can stop at the end of the month, you can stop at the end of the quarter, maybe the semester, halfway point, have a discussion with your class. Hey, how has this been going? What works? What doesn't? Solicit feedback. Um, a lot of times when you can work collaboratively with students about things like expectations in the classroom or, or classroom rules or whatever, um, you get better buy-in because students understand the why behind it or they were there when the thing got decided and they know the background behind it. Um, if they're not a part of it, make sure that they do understand the why or the reasoning behind it. That is a huge driving factor for a lot of kids. It's a huge driving factor for me as an adult. When a decision gets made or something gets brought down, I need to know the why behind it. And if I know the why behind it and it makes sense to me, I'm like, okay, yeah, I can totally get on board to something that may not have sounded like a great idea at first. If it can be explained to me and I'm like, oh, that makes sense, then I'm for it. Um, your kids are the same way. Be willing to admit when you make a mistake to your kids. That's huge too, showing that vulnerability. Um, showing vulnerability and empathy as a teacher is not a sign of weakness. It's, it's a sign that you're a human and you are not perfect. And that's great for students. I think it helps students feel more safe 
and less worried about like, well, I can't make a mistake in class or I can't do anything wrong or I can't, you know, I'm going to get yelled at for this thing or that thing. If they know like, hey, nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. You know, we're all showing that vulnerability, I think is important and it can make huge steps towards being more relatable. <laughs> Let's throw some more cliches out there. Kids don't learn from people they don't like. Um, that being said, uh, trying to be friends with the kids is probably one of the worst things I've seen. Some of the my least favorite teachers were the ones that thought they were all buddy buddy with you. I mean, it's borderline creepy sometimes and whatever. So um, when we say kids don't learn from people they don't like, it's not like because you're not goofy and hip and play video games and hacky sack in the hallway, right? Because that's a thing. Kids will want to learn from you because they like you because they respect you and they know that you treat them like an adult and you know there's that mutual respect so I'm um, hopefully in my spewing of all these strategies and ideas and sometimes cliches have you seen how sweaty I've gotten how hot it's gotten in here um hopefully you found something that connects with you something that works with you something that you can try out if you have an idea or a, or a tip or something I haven't covered please drop it in the comments um I always read it. Other people read it. Like, we'd love to get, like, other ideas. I am not the be-all, end-all of stuff. God knows. I've had some terrible classes. So, um, I'm just sharing some things that work for me because sometimes hearing about it from other people helps give you ideas and things that you can try. Um, good luck. Hang in there. You are doing the best that you can with what you have been given in this exact moment. And you're a good teacher. And you can do this. All right talk soon. See you later. Bye. Be sure to subscribe to the Reset EDU channel for the latest project updates and episodes. If you're interested in having a conversation or collaborating in a Reset for your own classroom, be sure to fill out the form at bit.ly forward slash Reset EDU. That is case sensitive, so type carefully or reach out via social media. Thank you for watching.